here. I'm excited to be here this morning. Um, if you're a guest or, or a new visitor, please come back next week for sure. Our teaching pastor, Pastor Matt, will be back. But right now, I'm going to address a controversy to start out with. Okay, I hope you're with me. Um, last week, Brandon, uh, Pastor Brandon taught, and he asked, you know, how many people said that Christmas was their favorite holiday? And I was shocked and dismayed when I stood in the back, and I only saw maybe a half a dozen hands go up. And I'm thinking, maybe you're shy, or maybe you forgot what it was like when you were a kid. I think if, if everybody in here was 10 and we asked that question, it would be different. Thank you. Because as far as I was concerned, when I was a kid, Christmas was the best holiday. I mean, there, was, there was no debate. Um, all my friends thought that Wayne Grimwood, who lived across the street, was Jewish, and he conceded that Christmas was the best holiday, just because it was, it was cool, right? And I loved Christmas for a number of reasons. One is because you have a lot of signs beforehand, right? You can get excited, right? So it starts with Right at Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was kind of a dress rehearsal for Christmas, right? You kind of ate the same food, but there was no one under the trappings. But then when I was young, the store started decorating after Thanksgiving. I don't know if it was a state law or whatever, but no one would have dared to put out a Christmas decoration before Thanksgiving. Just like, just like Jesus would have wanted. Um, so that was one of the signs. But all these other signs, when you'd see your neighbors putting up Christmas lights, or that when the teachers would start decorating their rooms, right? And, and, of course, we made some amazing, just, just amazing treasures by taking an a 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper and folding it off and cutting off the corners and made a snowflake. And I was from Los Angeles. I thought that's what they looked like. So they were always these rectangular things with some holes out of it. But that was really cool. You knew that Christmas was on the way. And I'll tell you what, the one way that you really, really knew that it was cemented and it was coming was the Sears catalog. <laughs> Oh, and I know that most of the people in here don't know what the Sears catalog is. One, you don't know what Sears is. Sears, <laughs> Sears, Sears was Amazon before the internet, okay? That's what Sears was. But the Sears catalog, and I was going to say that uh, this book, the size of a phone book, but I thought, no, you people don't know, half of you don't know what a phone book is, <laughs> right? But the Sears catalog was a big book. It was, all right, for the kids down here. Big, thick, right? It was really thick. And it it had everything. Sears, you could buy anything from Sears. You could buy a shed and diapers. Everything in there, you'd have it. And But the Christmas catalog had about, I don't know, 25% of it was toys. Oh. And so all the kids, we'd, we'd, get, we'd get our Sears catalog, and we'd lay on the living room floor, and you'd go through, and you'd just carefully go through each one, circling, you know, kind of considering it. Because we had to give a list to our parents who would give it to Santa Claus and our relatives, right? And you'd be, in your mind, you'd be doing the math. Oh, this chemistry set is way out of Santa's budget. I know that for a fact. It was like $79. But you had to really, really apply yourself because you, if you didn't give something good as far as a list, your Aunt Louise would give you something lame right? And so I remember this one Christmas, I was just going, oh, I don't know, this is too much to hope for, but if I could get this Mattel um, Hot Wheels garage and car wash, it actually washed the cars when you had the little crank went through there, oh, that would be it. If I could have that, that would almost be too much to hope for, but that's what God laid in my heart for that, for that <laughs> Christmas, right? And I want to tell you, God bless you, Aunt Louise. She's not with us anymore, but she scored on that one. So I, I got a big high five to give her when I meet her in heaven. So I really hope for Christmas. And, you know, kids hope for Christmas, but we hope for things as adults every day too, right? We're, this week, we're going to be hoping for stuff. Some of you are going to be hoping that you're not going to have a lot of traffic getting out of Duval tomorrow morning, right? Some of us are hoping for promotion at work or that you're going to do well on your school project when it comes due. Or maybe you're hoping for health or healing or protection for your family or happiness. Right? All these things are great, great things to hope for. But they pale in comparison to the hope we're talking about this morning. And I'm really, really excited to do that. If, uh, if you'd like in the app, there's some notes in there if you want to follow along. Um, you're welcome to do that. Also, some of the scriptures are in there. But right now, I'd like to pray for us, if I could. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this tremendous gift of hope. I thank you that you're here this morning. I pray that you will um, impart each person here with a extra boost of hope today. Some of us, it would be a, a booster shot, and some of us, we're going to get it for the first time. But Father, I pray that your hope would wash over these people this morning. 
We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, the word Advent, I don't use much except for about a month of the year. I don't know about you guys. So I thought, I'm going to look it up. Like I've, I've been a Christian most of my life, but I'm going to look it up. And Advent is the arrival of a notable person, thing, or event, which could also be summed up as Jesus, right? I thought that was kind of cool. But then I thought, all right, well, if I'm, if I'm looking up stuff, I might as well look up hope. I love this. Hope is an optimistic state of mind that is based on an expectation of positive outcomes with respect to events and circumstances in one's life or the world at large and could also be summed up as Jesus. How beautiful is that? So I'm going to hit hope a bunch today. And just to keep you guys uh, participating along, I'm going to hold this up. And each time I hold this up, I would like you guys to say hope. All right, so we're going to practice once just to make sure everybody's on the same page. All right. Nice, you know, I'm impressed because I thought it would just be a couple of the girls down here and that was it. So that's really cool that you guys all participated. Thank you for that. All right, so we are starting in Matthew chapter 1. We're going to actually start in verse 18, but the previous passage deals with the genealogy of Jesus. This was very important to the Jews. Genealogy is very important to the Jews, and they go back 42 generations to Abraham. But it's also important to us because it's proving the the historicity of Jesus, right? That Jesus came into the world through the line that God told us he was going to use. The interesting thing that not all the people in this lineage are Jews, and not all of them are great people, right? There's some adulterers in there, a couple of prostitutes, some bad kings, and at least one murderer, And I think the reason, partially why God uses that is I think he can show, look, this is is how the lineage that I brought in for my son, and I can use these people as they are, right? Just like he can use me and he can use you, we don't have to be perfect. We just have to be willing to serve him. God can use us as we come. This, This lineage is, in Matthew, is Joseph's lineage, but it also applies to Mary because they were of the same tribe, okay? So let's start in verse 18. Now, the the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So up until this time, Mary had been hanging out with her cousin Elizabeth. And so when she came back, it would have been something that she and Joseph needed to talk about, right? And he wasn't being legalistic in considering divorcing her. That would be something that he would be compelled to do by law. Okay? And he he knew this would be social suicide for Mary, and he had compassion for her. No doubt he loved her. He had feelings for her. But he's seeking to be righteous before God. Isn't he? I'm I'm sure he's pondering these things, right? This was a, a, a young girl, right? And she would be totally put to shame, but he was a young man as well, and a religious man, and he was thinking, what is he supposed to do? It says, but as he considered these things, I think that God was working on him, right? We already know that he was a just man, but God was considering the, or he was considering these things, and God was speaking to him through that time, I think. He was inclined, I think, to be merciful, just as God is merciful. And I think it's a great illustration to us that we are to consider things particularly things that are controversial right or or have great meaning that we should slow down and consider these things and see if god will prompt us to some and guide us in some decision but i don't think it's any accident that god chose joseph joseph is one to me one of the unsung heroes in the bible and he's just kind of this unassuming guy but imagine being put in that position right that's pretty pretty tough going It says, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Right on. Now, Joseph was a religious guy, right? So he had been familiar with a lot of verses that you and I are familiar with, no doubt, in the Old Testament. So I wonder when that was said in his thought process, maybe he thought about Psalms 39.7, which says, and now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. I don't know if you guys have ever been uh, directed in a dream. Have you ever felt that God has guided you or brought something to your mind? Or maybe that just happens when 
you know, you have quiet time, but I think it's really important for us to consider that we set those times aside, that we can listen for God's promptings, right? And maybe he's not going to speak to us in a direct voice, but I do believe that he will influence our thoughts in that way. And I know that I have to struggle with that because um, I battle what C.S. Lewis calls the kingdom of noise. You guys ever have that where you have to have something on all the time, and that is not good for me. So I have to uh, force myself sometimes to, to get away from, from distractions and sound that way, and that's important, I think. In this, of course, Joseph is reminded that, hey, I'm a descendant of David, so that means this child is going to be a descendant of David as well. This is showing us, too, a, a new age of the Holy Spirit. Up until this time, you know, the Holy Spirit appears through the, the Old Testament, in a different way than he's appearing now. Now it looks like he is stepping in to educate and speak to humanity in a way that we didn't see much in the Old Testament. So we see that the Holy Spirit's role is changing here. He's starting to prepare us with understanding. Verse 21 says, And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Does that make the hair stand up on the back here? back of your neck it does me there you go sorry i stepped on your line that was my fault maybe again another verse came to his mind maybe he thought about psalms 135 that says i wait for the lord my soul waits in his word i will hope the name jesus was very common in first century palestine it means god saves but this time of course it's the one this time it's not in anticipation, right? This time it's the one. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, and the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Maybe he thought about Jeremiah twenty nine eleven that says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. This is a new concept. The Jews would not understand this concept that God would be with us, right? They, they understood the reverence, but they didn't understand the personal relationship that we have with God. This would be a big deal. The, this is a, a, a game changer. We now have this, this personal relationship with God, but of course that's tied to reverence, right? It's not that God is our homeboy, right? God is definitely our friend, and God's intimate. We have a relationship with him. But it reminds me of when Jesus taught us how to pray, right? He said, our Father who art in heaven. So there's this, this component to God that he is intimate, like a father would be, but he's also God of the universe. And when Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she'd given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Now we're going to drop to Luke chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 8. And i got to tell you, I've been looking forward to this for about six weeks because this is one of my absolute favorite passages in the Bible. Really, really excited about this. I'm going to give you a little bit of setup here. This is going to take place in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is a little bit to the south of Jerusalem. And people would have to go to Jerusalem in a pilgrimage to go into the temple, and they would have to offer sacrifices to, uh, for their sins, right, in, in the temple. And you can imagine these people would be traveling by foot, and it would be like going, you know, sometimes it would be several days' walk, so it would be going with your whole family on a camping trip, you know, and you can imagine them packing up, and, they're, you know, did you get the sleeping bag, and you get the stove and everything, right? They, they get everything going, they're ready to go, but then they think, oh, we got to bring, did you bring the lamb? No, we forgot the lamb. All right, no problem. We'll stop in, in Bethlehem because Bethlehem's main industry was raising lambs, sacrificial lambs. Because it would be much more convenient than to stop by and pick one up in Bethlehem as they're going up to the temple than to drag a lamb, you know, from, from a small town that they came from, right? And let me tell you that I do not believe it's a coincidence that Jesus was born in Bethlehem where the main industry was raising sacrificial lambs right? Jesus, the Lamb of God, was born in a place where that's what they did. No coincidence. All right, starting at verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in a field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. 
This is very descriptive for a number of reasons. One is they're, keep, they're, they're shepherds. They're keeping watch over their flocks by night. What are they not doing? They're not dreaming, right? Shepherds' duty was to guard, guard the sheep from thieves and from, from wild animals. So these guys would be very attentive. These shepherds would not be prestigious people in the community. These would be poor, kind of the lower run of, of the social ladder. They would be nomadic, um, They'd probably smell, right? They've been hanging out with sheep forever. They'd be exposed to the elements. They'd be, of course, a member of a conquered people, and they'd be uneducated. But, of course, God has a heart for shepherds, doesn't he? David was a shepherd, and Moses was a shepherd. And you think, well, why would God appear to these people? Why shepherds? But maybe it fits in with this big plan, right? Why a teenage girl... Why a poor carpenter in a backwater town? Why a manger? And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Have you guys ever backpacked where you're miles away from any light? I don't know, maybe I'm the sissy, but when I'm out there, if I hear a twig go, it's on, right? I'm sure it's just a rat or something, but... I'm thinking, well, that's probably, it could be a grizzly, it could be a mountain lion. You know, I'm just kind of weighing like that. So these guys are out in the dark, right? And they're just guarding, and they probably are already listening for, you know, any kind of thieves or, or critters or anything coming around. And boom, an angel appears, the glory of the Lord shines around them. Yikes, right? They're dark, all of a sudden, yikes. Imagine that. Imagine being out there, okay? And guess what? They're freaked out because an angel appears, Guess what? Every time an angel appears in the Bible, people get freaked out. Almost every time an angel says, fear not. That's the first thing they say, fear not. This is how I know that angels are not little naked babies with wings, right? They're big, scary beings. If a little naked baby popped here, I'd probably address it, but I wouldn't, you know, he probably wouldn't have to tell me to, to fear not, right? But if an angel appeared, yes, I'm going to freak out. Okay? And so, so this was kind of a a crash of beings, right? You have this, these heavenly beings wrapped in the glory of God. The heavenly being wrapped in the glory of God comes down to shepherds, right? A, a, a clash of beings. What do they say? This angel says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I will bring you great news of great joy that will be for all of the people. Oh. Yeah! Psalms 42.5. These guys would know scripture as well, right? They've heard about this. They've heard about this. These guys would be Jews. Maybe they thought about 42.5. Why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. Humanity has nothing to fear when God moves in grace. The gospel, great news for all the people. He didn't say, I got great news for the angels. Nope. He came to these most, most humble guys and said, I have great news for all the people. Not just the religious rulers, not just the, the wealthy people, not just the people high up in the government, for all the people. And throughout, this is very interesting, throughout the Bible, angels are somehow tied into our well-being, right? We see them intervening on our behalf and and influencing it. And the Bible says that, you know, angels appear to us in different ways that we don't even know about. It's pretty cool that we have these, this army, right, of, of angels going around up there. And I also love that God chose this way to speak to the shepherds. Now, yes, it would be overwhelming, but they would understand the concept of angels. They would have heard that many times. And God chooses different ways to speak to us, doesn't he? Sometimes he'll speak to us in a dream. Sometimes he'll speak to us through through a talk or a book or, or a song. Remember the wise men who were astronomers he spoke to through a star. It's really cool the way that God adjusts his message so it best relates to us. But they were figuring out that humankind is changed this day. For unto you is born this day in the city of David who is Christ the Lord. Sorry, in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This is for you, the average person. Unto you, these shepherds. 
Maybe they thought about Psalms 147, 11. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those whose hope is steadfast love. This is the one you've been looking for. This is the one that your grandfather and your great-grandfather was talking about. This is the one that for 2,000 years we've been waiting for this time, right? From the time that Abraham was told that it was going to be through his line. Maybe you go back 4,000 years to where Eve was told through your line you're going to crush Satan's head. They've been waiting a long, long time for this. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. This is unexpected. God comes to earth and he's going to be born a baby, probably in a palace with a bunch of well-dressed people attending him, wrapped in the finest silk, right? Everything would be perfect. Nope. It's not how God chose to do it. Born to a humble couple, announced to some humble guys that worked with sheep, in a cave, laying in a horse trough. Jesus may be in the manger, but heaven is there. The most humble circumstances. And I was thinking about how Jesus distinguished himself throughout his time on earth through his humility and his humiliation, doesn't he? Lowering himself, being God, lowering himself to our level, willing to put up with all the things he had to put up with, is demonstrating his humility. All right, here's the good part. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. All right, I got a question for you. We've already established that when the angel came, message received, right? He impressed them, right? It was dark. They're sitting out here. It's quiet. Just hear the sheep bleeding. He appears. Boom. The glory of the Lord shone around. Why did a multitude come? We'll see. We're going to jump to Romans 8, verse 19, and I think it might explain this. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, For in this we hope we're saved. For in this hope we were saved. Okay. This is Scott now. This didn't come out of any commentary or anything like this. This is what I think. Well, we know that creation's been waiting for redemption, right? Since the fall. Creation's been waiting for this. No doubt the angels have been waiting for this, right? The angels were created before Eden. But I don't know how it works in heaven, but I imagine they're going around and they're thinking, I wonder when this is going to happen. You know, he, we know that he's going to redeem it. What, 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 when is this going to happen? And then I imagine, this isn't in any book, I just imagine that as the angels are walking around, maybe one of them said, did you see Gabriel's going in and out of God's office like four times yesterday? <laughs> no. Something's going on. I don't, well, it could be. I don't know. It could be. Don't you think that the angels are waiting for redemption, right? The angels want stuff fixed. They know that it's broken. They know that this is not how it's supposed to be. The suddenly is hope. I don't know if this is how it was, but I think, and this is how I want to think, and maybe God will set me straight, but I think the angels are up there watching from their angelic dimension, and the one angel come and proclaims this, and the rest of them couldn't be restrained. They knew what was going on. They've been waiting for this for thousands of years. They say, hey, God is fixing this finally. We've been waiting so long. We want it to be right again. 
We want it to be how it was before where there was no death and there was no disease. Animals all got along, right? There was no sorrow. They want that back. And now it's happening. And you, I don't know if they had like, like heavenly restraints back there where everybody's you know, trying to keep the angels back, but they weren't going to have it. They came forward proclaiming what's going on. I'll say it. If that doesn't light your fire, your kindling is wet. Because that is, that is exciting. And we don't know how many, where it says multitude, that can mean thousands or that can be more. Right? We don't know how many that is. We don't know how, there's, Revelation tells us there, there's like maybe 100 million angels. But we don't know how many it is, but I'm telling you they're excited. Now to the end of that verse, though, it says, And on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased, that tells us that not everyone is going to respond to this call. Tragically, not everyone will. Down to verse 15, it says, When the angels went away from heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. You know what they didn't say? Let's go see if this is true. Nope. Let's go. Let's go. The one? Let's go. They're going. And they went. How'd they go? With haste. And found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. They made known the message of hope, didn't they? That, of course, is a natural reaction when the gospel clicks with us. We got to say something. We got to say something. This is amazing. We got to say something. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. Could this be what we've been waiting for? Could this be what we've heard about time after time after time for thousands of years? Could this be the time? We're conquered right now. How can this be the time? It's, it's a, these, these humble guys... You know, in a cave, how could this be the time? It's the time. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Mary, of course, had a religious upbringing too. Maybe she thought about Psalms 119, 14. That says, you are my hiding place and my shield. And I hope in your word. Imagine Mary. What, what was Mary feeling? God's going to trust me with this? Wow. How much that tells us about God. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Hope, absolutely. They couldn't stop from doing that. I, I look at evangelism like, like that sometimes that Picture yourself that you're on a ship in the middle of the ocean, and it's cold, and the water's cold, but you're standing on the deck, and your hair's a little bit wet, but you've got a warm blanket wrapped around you because somebody's just pulled you out of that water. And you're standing at the rail, and you look down, and you see somebody is in there. And you know that they can't last only so long in that water. They're going to die. They're going to go under. And you look down, and there's a life preserver right there. Maybe it says the USS Hope on it. I don't know. All you have to do is throw that to them. And if they take it, awesome. If they don't, you're pleading with them. Right? Just grab the life preserver. Grab the life preserver and Jesus will pull it in and he's going to wrap a blanket around you and we're going to have a party. That's what these guys are doing, right? These shepherds are desperate to tell people about this. They cannot be just keep that to themselves. They have to share it. What kind of person would stand in a rail and not throw somebody a life preserver? We have to do that, right? They had to do that. It reminds me of Hebrews 10.23 that says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Our world is pretty hopeless today, isn't it? You only have to spend about three minutes on social media. If you think it's hopeful, check, check out social media. It's, it's without hope. And people say, well, this is the worst it's ever been. I don't know. I don't know if it's the worst it's ever been. 
in the 60s, it was awful. I know you hear people that lived through the 60s, they'll say that. And in the 30s, and you know, different times in history, I think it, it's bad a lot. Because societies always base their hope on the things of men. Right? So if, if you're basing your hope on your king, or your president, or your revolution, or your political system, or your wealth, or whatever you're going to base it on, it's going to fail. And here's how I know it's going to fail, because it failed every single time in history. Every single time. The only thing that's going to restore hope and peace and unity, which I hear a lot of people talking about now, the only, thing, the only way that's going to happen, the only hope that we have is through Jesus Christ. Every other time. I don't, it, people are really a dumb creature, aren't we? How many times does it have to fail before we figure out, huh, well, maybe we shouldn't do it on our own. Maybe we should consider Jesus, right? Nope. We consider it time after time after time. The only one that's going to give us any hope is Jesus Christ. One of the things I, I get to do as a pastor is officiate at funerals, and it's, it's, a, it's a great honor to do that. And funerals are never, you know, joyous occasions, of course. But most of the funerals I've done have been for non-believers. And there is no less hopeful place than the funeral of a non-believer. Because they've gone under. Right? But it's different for those of us that follow Jesus. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 that, yes, we mourn when we have a funeral because we're going to miss that person for a time, but we don't mourn like those that have no hope. We don't mourn for those that, we don't mourn like those that don't have Jesus. So, who should be hopeful in this room today? Well, every one of you who have chosen to follow Jesus, even though you know you are very far from perfection, you know you are assured of your salvation, you know that Jesus is with you every single day, you have hope. You're crazy with hope. How thankful you should be for that. What about those here that feel distant from God? Maybe you grew up in the church. Maybe, um, you know, at one time you felt close to God, but you've ignored him or, um, you know, kind of, you don't think about him. I mean, maybe you've done stuff that you think, well, I've gone too far now. He, I don't even know if he wants me back. I'd be too embarrassed to come back to him. Let me tell you, he is on the wall like, like the father of the prodigal son looking for you. He is looking at every step you take away from him. He is thinking, I can't wait for that one that he turns back. He's looking and say, when she, when she turns back to me, it's going to be so joyous because I'm going to welcome her back and I never stop loving her and I'll make sure that she knows that. So if you've been distant from God, but you knew at one time, you have hope. You're a wash in hope. What if you're here today and you're not sure if there even is a God? Never been like a real thing to you. You have to see, you have to, you have to come and put your hands in, in Je- or your finger in Jesus' hands to fill the hole. Maybe that's you, right? Maybe you can't even let yourself fantasize about having a relationship with Jesus like that. Or maybe you're here and you hate God. There are, I guarantee there are people in this room that hate God because you think that God did you wrong. There was something that you should have gotten and you didn't get. Or there's something that God should have saved you from that happened to you. It was terrible. And you hate him for it. And, and you don't think that you can ever restore a relationship like that. You know what? God loves you as much as anybody else in this room. And God wants so badly for you to to be in a relationship with him. He cannot wait for the opportunity. But he needs you to take a little reach over to that life preserver, just a little bit. So he can start that process and pull you in. Whatever it is you have to surrender, maybe it's your pride, maybe you're fearful, maybe you, you're, you're, um, 
You struggle with your intellect and how can there be a God? Whatever it is, you need to surrender it. You need to surrender it today. The reason why Christmas exists is because of you. You, the one that hates God, you, the one that doesn't believe in God, the reason why Christmas happened is because of you. Jesus went to the cross, suffered tremendous humiliation, pain, and death with you on his mind. Just have to reach. You reach to that, he's going to pull you in. If you want to know anything more about that, come and talk to me or any of the elders or any of the Jesus lovers in the room will be happy to share that with you because we're at the railing. We're no better than you. We're just got a blanket wrapped around us and we're up on the deck. We want you all to come up with us. What a great, great gift of hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you loved us so much that, that you chose this unlikely way and this unlikely system to reach us to come down to the lowest of us so that you could save us and you could redeem us, ultimately so you can be in a relationship with us. I pray, Father, that every single person in this room would leave here with more hope than what they came in with. And Father, I pray if there's anybody in here that has not chosen to follow you or hates you, that you would speak to them right now, that you would move them. That, Father, they are here for some reason. Somebody brought them or they thought... They would just see what this is all about. There's some reason why they're here, Father. Talk to them this morning, Father. Make yourself undeniable to them. Make yourself irresistible to them, just like a drowning man would be when he's reaching for a life preserver. We love you, Jesus, for all that you've done for us. Help us to remember that as we are celebrating when you started this path of hope for us. And it's in your name we pray, amen.